The Tom Woods Show, episode 1688. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, social media is a pit of misinformation when it comes to the subject of guns. So what you need is my free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About Guns. Smashes all the myths and a lot of fun to read. Pick it up at wrongaboutguns.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Tom DiLorenzo is back with us today. Tom has recently retired as a professor of economics from Loyola University in Baltimore, and he is the author of numerous books. And today we're going to be talking about his brand new one, released just today, The Problem with Lincoln. Tom, welcome back. Please be with you again, Tom. Was it 2002 that you released The Real Lincoln? Yeah, the hardback came out in 2002, the uh, end, sort of the end of the year, and then uh, it sold out very quickly. And then the paperback came out in uh, March of 2003. Okay. So naturally, the question that will arise from some of your faithful readers is, why in 2020 another book on Lincoln? Let's just get that out of the way. Yeah, well, if they are faithful readers, they'll know that uh, for the past 18 years, I've spent a good bit of time uh, researching, writing, speaking, debating, uh, and, and, and also reading uh, research by other people, including a lot of uh, very good books uh, that are uh, take a, a critical look at Lincoln, uh, like I did. And so I've incorporated what I've learned over the past 18 years into uh, writing up this book, which was uh, originally publishing, by the way, approached me about it. I didn't uh, I didn't make a proposal to them. They contacted me and asked me if I thought it was time for another book on Lincoln. And so um, the rest of it is history. Well, indeed. All right. I want to try to this time maybe cover some things we haven't done in the past, even though I think the last time we talked about Lincoln was many, many hundreds of episodes ago. So if there is some overlap, I don't think anybody's going to hold that against us. Because I definitely will want to spend some time on the Chapter 9 St. Lincoln material, because some of that is just yes. you know, the way the Lincoln legacy has been used by some people is very important, I think, for some people to see clearly what's going on. Well, let's. how about we just start with this? The standard view that people have – now. I understand that professional historians know things about Lincoln that the average person does not. So the, a professional historian, you have to go have a different tack because, yeah, they'll say, yeah, of course we know. We're not idiots. Of course we know that the Civil War was not launched to free the slaves. We all know that. But the average American obviously does not know that. Or if you say Lincoln held the following views about black Americans – yeah, again, historians will say, yeah, we can read. We, we see the Lincoln-Douglas debates. We, we know what Lincoln said about these things. Now, some of them may say he had to say that in order to get people on his side, What you know, whatever, but at least they acknowledge that he said it. But again, the average person doesn't know any of that. So why don't we just get out of the way for anybody listening who may still have some lingering attachment to the schoolhouse rock view of Lincoln, if there is one, What's the standard view of Lincoln that the average person, not the historians, but the average person holds, and what's wrong with it? I mean, and I know we could do the whole episode on that, but but give me your elevator pitch. Uh, well, the, the average person has been taught since elementary school that he uh, saved the Union and freed the slaves. And, of course, the Union was a voluntary union, the Union of the Founding Fathers. Uh, Article 7 of the Constitution says that uh, the Union uh, or the Constitution will be ratified by the, uh, the citizens of the states, which it was, they were the sovereigns. They delegated certain powers to the federal government for their benefit, and Lincoln's uh, war destroyed that. The union became a coerced union held together by violence, uh, much more similar to the old Soviet Union than to the original American Union. And then he freed the slaves. Well, I include an appendix that has the, the complete Emancipation Proclamation in uh, my new book, The Problem with Lincoln. And, uh, and as, as the historians know, it specifically exempted all the areas of the country uh, where the Union Army was in control at the time, including the entire state of West Virginia, uh, the last slave state to enter the Union, which means it was unable to free anybody. And the older generations of um, historians uh, said this in their writings, but it's been sort of covered up. And, and we're, just, we're all just taught this mantra, free the slaves and save the union. But, uh, but no, 
And I even uh, write uh, about David Donald, who's the, the preeminent Lincoln scholar of the last generation, who writes in his book, his, his um, biography of Lincoln, that uh, Lincoln's role in getting the 13th Amendment passed was greatly exaggerated by most historians. He actually did very little, according to David Donald, to do that, even though Steven Spielberg made a whole movie based on supposedly his genius in getting the 13th Amendment passed after, after his death. All right, so that, I wanted to get that uh, out of the way. Now, again, there's there's so much material here, and uh, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to, to, to do all of it, because you could talk about the way the war was conducted, you talk about Lincoln's racial views, you could talk about peaceful emancipation, why that wasn't tried, you talk about Lincoln and the Constitution, you talk about the Hamiltonianism at the heart of it. Um, just, I, I don't even know what to, yeah. I don't know, you know what? Well, well, you tell me what we should do next, because I'm I'm at a loss. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I do cover a lot of ground in this in a relatively short book. But one thing that's um, I think readers find interesting is I provide in appendices the first inaugural address of Jefferson Davis, and then the first inaugural address of Abraham Lincoln. And if you want to know why there was a war, first of all, you have to understand that secession per se does not necessitate war. Uh, you know, the, when the, when the uh, Russian uh, satellites uh, seceded peacefully, there was no war. And with the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, Norway and Sweden, Maine and Massachusetts, there were no wars over secession. So secession itself does not necessarily lead to war. But if you just read these first inaugural addresses of the two presidents, Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln, uh, what they both say, especially Lincoln, Lincoln bent over backwards to say, uh, I have no intention of uh, disturbing Southern slavery. He, uh, he supported in that same speech, the Corwin Amendment, which would have prohibited the federal government from ever interfering with slavery. But when it came to tariff collection, he threatened war. He, he used the words uh, invasion and bloodshed to uh, describe what would happen to the people of any state that refused to collect the tariff on imports, which had just been more than doubled two days earlier. And that was the primary source of federal income at the time. It accounted for more than 90% of all federal revenues. And then you read uh, alongside that, Jefferson Davis's first inaugural address. And he says basically the same thing from the opposite perspective. He says, we are a trading society. We engage in uh, commerce uh, with uh, throughout the world. And we're willing to defend ourselves against an invasion of any country, any government that wants to interfere with that. And so there was actually no, no mention of slavery in Jefferson Davis's first inaugural address because both men understood that uh, what was threatening war at the time, and the war of course was imminent within uh, weeks, uh, was uh, the, the dispute over tariffs. And so that's one thing uh, that, that I, I do in much more detail in this book than, uh, than the, the original. Uh, let's say something, because since your book came out, Jim Powell's book, Greatest Emancipations, came out. That was 2008, and I've had him on to talk about how slavery ended in most of the world. It's an interesting story, of course, and, and related to, to this story. So you, in Chapter 5, talk about what you call Lincoln's greatest failure. So l- let's talk about that, particularly in light of the kinds of examples that Jim gives in his book. Uh, yeah, you know, I, uh, in a recent article of mine on lourockwell.com, I, I cited um, Thomas Fleming, the historian, the historian Thomas Fleming. And he, he wrote a book called A Disease in the Public Mind. And, you know, he's a famous historian. He wrote uh, histories of both world wars, biography of George Washington. And he's, he's a very prominent uh, man. And he was perplexed by the fact that the United States was the only country in the world in the 19th century that ended slavery that, in a way that involved a war, and especially a war that killed as many as, uh, you know, almost 750,000 people, according to the latest research. And so on the issue, and, and this is another thing that most Americans just simply don't know. They, 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 my experience has been, they, they just assume that uh, when slavery ended in the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the French, the Danes, the Dutch, there must have been some great war of emancipation in all these countries because Americans are very bad at studying uh, European history, let alone American history. And that's simply not true. And yeah, in Jim Powell's excellent book, uh, Greatest Emancipations, gives chapter and verse 
of how all the countries of the world, including the northern states in the United States, ended slavery peacefully. You know, uh, New Hampshire passed a law for gradual emancipation in 1857, four years before the Civil War started. And basically, that, that's what happened. It was some way of, comp- they figured out some way of compensating slave owners as a way of uh, uh, avoiding conflict. And, uh, and I, in my book, uh, I write, well, yes, there are a lot of libertarians who are deeply offended by the use of tax dollars or the, the very idea of the use of tax dollars to be given to slave owners. But uh, what I say about this is, is, can you think of a better use of tax dollars than purchasing the freedom of slaves, one, and two, uh, that act uh, avoiding a war that kills hundreds of thousands of people, because that was, that was the alternative in, in our history. And so it's hard to think, of, in my view, of a better use of tax dollars than purchasing the freedom of slaves and then ending it once and for all, like the British did. Well, since you did mention the the other option, which was a war that killed many people, and I think since your book, there's been a a slight uptick among historians in the number of people they take to have died, as because I think it, people used to say six hundred and twenty thousand, and yes. I think now it's gone up a bit. Um, can we say something about the way the war was conducted? Uh, well, yeah, the uh, you know the uh, the original war plan was called the Anaconda Plan. Uh, in uh, Lincoln's war plan, it was to starve out the South, civilians included, with blockades. And basically, total war was waged on a civilian population of the South for four years. Uh, I, I quote uh, James McPherson, you know, who's, who's uh, now retired from Princeton, but he was considered for many years to be the dean of Civil War historians. And even in his book, Battle Cry of Freedom, he uh, estimates that some 50,000 Southern civilians died in the war. And, uh, and since the publication of The Real Lincoln 18 years ago, uh, one book that I cite that came up after that uh, was uh, Waging War on Southern Civilians by Walter Bryan Sisko. And he uses a lot of primary sources, including the, uh, the official records of the, uh, the war published by the U.S. government. Uh, to talk about this, and I cite him very extensively in that one chapter, and uh, of some of the atrocities that, that occurred, um, such as you know Sherman uh, standing outside of Atlanta after the Confederate Army had left and lobbying, literally having his army lobby literally thousands of artillery shells on the civilians who were left in the in the city of Atlanta uh, in, in November of 1864. And so, uh, and that sort of thing. And you read the reports of this, of people being cut in half, the corpses of children in the streets, and Sherman more or less smiling at it and saying, this will quicken the end of the war. And that's the kind of people who, uh, who wage the war. And I also uh, make a point to a site that it took a, a particular type of soldier, quote, soldier, to wage this kind of war. And I cite some mainstream historians is noting that uh, a lot of the, uh, the European governments emptied out some of their prisons and sent these people to America who signed up into Lincoln's army. And they're, they're the ones who uh, participated in the rape, pillaging, and plundering of Georgia and South Carolina to a large extent with, uh, with Sherman's army and, and, and with others at the same time. And so I do devote a whole chapter to that that is uh, – it's even more severe, I would say, than uh, than what I wrote about in The Real Lincoln. All right, I've got some juicy stuff to throw at you in just a minute, but first let's pause for a quick message. Folks, I'm down here in Florida, as you know, and the summer here is insane. It's crazy hot out there, and between the heat and humidity, dehydration kicks in fast. Hydrant is your key to getting back up and running more quickly than ever before. Hydrant has created a refreshing electrolyte powder that you mix directly into water, to efficiently and effectively hydrate your body. It hydrates you quickly, keeps you going for longer. Each rapid hydration mix has the four essential electrolytes your body needs, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and zinc, and it packs a punch to help your body hydrate fast and stay hydrated. The Hydrant formula was developed by an Oxford scientist, and it's loved by pro athletes, top performers, celebrities, and has thousands of five-star reviews. Comes in a variety of flavors, including new summer-friendly iced tea lemonade and fruit punch. I myself am partial to the blood orange, and when I mix it with 16 ounces of water, it gives me a nice, subtle, but enjoyable taste, refreshes me, and I feel great afterward. 
You really need to try it for yourself to see what I'm talking about. It tastes incredible and it works. We've got a special deal for our listeners to save 25% off your first order. Go to drinkhydrant.com slash woods or enter our promo code woods at checkout. That's D-R-I-N-K-H-Y-D-R-A-N-T dot com slash woods and enter promo code woods for 25% off your first order. Drinkhydrant.com slash woods and enter promo code woods to save 25%. And we thank them for sponsoring the podcast. I've skipped ahead a bit because there's a there was a quotation that I liked on page um, 132. And this is a quotation actually from a book written in 1943 by Ira Cardiff called The Deification of Lincoln. Now that, that title must have jumped right out at you when you, when you saw that. Right. And Cardiff writes this, that most Americans, and this, then this is a quotation, are not at all interested in the truth about Lincoln. They desire a supernatural Lincoln, a Lincoln with none of the faults or frailties of the common man. A biography of Lincoln which told the truth about him would probably have great difficulty finding a publisher. Well, that's an interesting and, and revealing remark. So let's say something about it because there's there's so many aspects of of Lincoln as as a saint. When, I mean, one of them is uh, that derives from it is there are all these fake Lincoln quotations, and of course, people are inclined to believe them all because they know Lincoln was a great man. So he must have said all these brilliant, insightful, and 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 prescient things. And then we can just go on down the list. Or because Lincoln was so saintly, I can cite him on behalf of whatever it is: national service programs, uh, whatever it is, because. If I have Lincoln on my side, who can be against me? That that kind of thing. So so let's start there. Now, by the way, the the fake Lincoln quotes are just my my rule for fake Lincoln quotes or fake founding fathers quotes is that if a quotation sounds like it could have been uttered yesterday, it probably was. Yeah, very true. Yeah. So you want to talk about the quotes? Well, I don't want because there there are a lot of them. I yeah. want to talk about this process, first of all, by which Lincoln goes from being a politician like any other to being the great, you know, the basically the great refounder of the country. Uh, and then, secondly, I'd like to talk about once that's done, what use is this put to by some people? Yeah, well, I, I quote, there's a, you know, since the real Lincoln was published, there's a book that came out called The Unpopular Mr. Lincoln by Larry Tagg, T A G G. And he makes the case, based on primary sources, that Abraham Lincoln was by far the most hated and reviled of all American presidents during his lifetime. And he's talking about the northern population. He's not talking about the south. And you know, nobody would argue that uh, he did not have that reputation in the south in the, during his time. And so the question is, well, well how did this happen? How did, how did he become the most saintly figure of all American presidents? And it began with the deification of Lincoln. And I, and I write about how if just about everybody who knew Lincoln knew that he was an atheist, didn't believe in God, never belonged to church, to church barely stepped into a church. His wife said that. Uh, his law partners called him an infidel uh, and, and, and on and on. And even the um, you know, Doris Kearns Goodwin, who wrote a, a, a big, long thousand page uh, biography of Lincoln, Team of Rivals, which was supposedly the basis of Steven Spielberg's movie, she says that uh, poor Lincoln, he didn't believe in an afterlife, therefore he must have suffered more than most during the, during the war, knowing that he would not be able to see his loved ones after he died. And so the historians know this, they know that he was a, an atheist, but they still keep writing books with titles like Abraham Lincoln, Man of God, or Abraham Lincoln, Redeemer of President, and this occurred almost immediately after his death with his uh, funeral, uh, which was conducted basically by William Seward, who, uh, who ordered that um, the corpse should not be touched up so that it would look as gruesome as possible. And they took it on a 1,600-mile train trip around the country. And then, uh, you know, all of a sudden, Lincoln became a saint. Uh, you, there, were, there were images of him with angels' wings ascending to heaven and things like that. And he was literally deified, and uh, and I make the case in the book that that led to a deification of the presidency, and and of uh, the federal government in general. And then there, uh, I quote um, also uh, uh, a literature on what's called the Treasury of Virtue, 
that the, the U.S. government was said to have a treasury of virtue by virtue of what the actions of Abraham Lincoln in, in the Civil War. So the whole government became hyper-virtuous in theory by this uh, never-ending drumbeat of, uh, about St. Abraham that we have. So that the idea was that virtually anything the government did was virtuous by virtue of the fact that it was the U.S. government doing it. And, uh, and you know, whether it's entering World War I, entering World War II, uh, invading Afghanistan. And to this day, even foreign dictators invoke Abraham Lincoln when they want to do something tyrannical. I quote uh, Musharraf, the former dictator of Pakistan, when he declared martial law in his country, uh, is saying, well, Abraham Lincoln did it. And so therefore, we're supposed to all say, well, it, it, might, it has to be a, not only a good idea, but a moral idea if Abraham Lincoln did it. And like, like I said, even, even foreign dictators have caught on to this. I think that, at least for my money, one of the most arresting aspects of all this is a story you tell, I don't know how many years ago it was, but in one of your articles, you talked about Eric Foner, who you know I managed to avoid studying with while I was at Columbia, but he is considered to be one of the you know more important American historians around, but he's also you know a a Marxist and not not the kind of Marxist to say. Uh, the, the Soviet Union isn't real communism, but instead, no, his whole family had been apologists for the communist regimes for their entire lives. And when, what, well, you know what, why don't you finish telling the story? What happens in, uh, with the, you know, the breakup of the Soviet Union and, and Eric Foner? Yeah, he, he published an article in The Nation magazine, February 11th, 1991, entitled Lincoln's Lesson in which he opposed the breakup of the Soviet Union. He called it a dismemberment, uh, and he said uh, uh, the, you know, Lincoln would never have allowed such such a thing to happen like Gorbachev uh, was doing. And he, he, he called it a, a Soviet communism, a, a noble experiment. <laughs> and, uh, and like you said, he, his whole family were, uh, he came from a family of communists. And so this was 1991, you know, it's sort of at the end of the dismemberment, uh, to use Foner's word, of the Soviet Union. And he was very depressed about the whole thing. And so that's, that's and Eric, like you said, Eric Foner is one of the giants in so-called Civil War history in America. You know, he taught at your alma mater, Columbia, for many years. Right. And that type of remark is so shockingly revealing. Now, at the same time, there will no doubt be, I mean, remember, we're dealing with a lot of people in, in the U.S. who, when 9-11 occurred, thought that history began on September 11th, 2001. There, there was no context for this. They just thought yeah. that apparently, out of the blue, they'd been attacked for no particular reason. They couldn't even account for why it could have happened. So that, or when was it Jimmy Carter? I'm trying to remember when, it might have been Jimmy Carter, when uh, the Iran hostages were taken in 1979. Somebody said, well, you know, remember, there's still some festering resentment over the coup in 1953, uh, held, you know, pushed along mm. by the CIA. And I think it was Jimmy Carter who said, well, that's ancient history. Ancient history, 26 years ago. So this is going to seem like ancient, ancient history. So why does it matter that we get this right today in 2020? Well, you know, uh, I was just thinking this morning of writing my next article for lourockwell.com with a title of uh, Did the Civil War uh, Guarantee That We'll Have Another One? Because one of the uh, effects of Lincoln's war was basically to destroy the system of federalism and decentralized government, the Jeffersonian system, and to put in, uh, in its place high, highly centralized monopolistic government and so ever since then, politics has been all about this great competition, take total monopolistic control over this gigantic government. And of course, it wasn't gigantic in 1866 compared to today, but today it certainly is. So when we look at the impending uh, presidential election in a few months, uh, there are a lot of people all over the, uh, the Internet and, and elsewhere warning of another civil war. Well, why is that? Well, the, the people who have such a violent hatred of Donald Trump are not going to accept his reelection. And then the people who support Trump, which is about half of the voters, are certainly not going to support uh, 
the party of Antifa in the, if if, uh, if he loses. And so uh, you know, I'm not predicting a civil war, but a lot of other people are. And I think uh, the uh, the what happened at the end of the the first civil war cemented into place this inevitable, uh, never-ending acrimony in politics because of the centralization of, of power. And I'm hoping it'll end in a the, more in a similar way to the uh, the way the Soviet Union ended in a, in a devolution of power. Uh, maybe not putting power in the hands of the oligarchs like they did uh, eventually in Russia, but uh, a devolution of power uh, in the direction of freedom rather than rule by oligarchs, as opposed to another bloody civil war. But I think that's uh, Lincoln's uh, war cemented that system into place of a monopolistic, highly centralized government and rendered federalism um, irrelevant, basically because the principles of secession and nullification were um, were destroyed. Now, th- this is a, a tough one to end on because maybe there's a lot of material to cover, but at least, again, in brief, we could address the, because you just mentioned secession, the claim that anybody seceding from the Union is a quote-unquote traitor, which is such a fourth-grade kind of accusation. Like, you traitor, you're not following our ruling class. Like, yes. <laughs> like, oh, wow, really? I am not following the American ruling class. Wow, that's the worst possible thing you could say about me. Really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, go tell the teacher I'm not following the ruling class. I mean, just what a bizarre, emasculating thing to say. You know, you traitor. But it's actually not treason. I mean, clearly, I mean, clearly and obviously, when you look at the actual history and not slogans, It clearly isn't. So how do you address the Lincoln was fighting against treasonous people? Well, I I quote the Constitution. Article 3, Section 3 defines treason as, they use the word only, only levying war upon the United States or or giving aid and comfort to their enemies. And the key word here is there because it means the the words United States is in the plural. And what what that means is it's the individual states. The free and independent states, as they're called in the Declaration of Independence. And so levying war upon the free and independent states is the only definition of treason in the Constitution. And that's exactly what Lincoln did. He levied war upon the southern uh, states in, in, the, in the United States. And so uh, it, was the, it was the Union Army and Lincoln and the Republican Party who were guilty of treason. But during the war, Lincoln took it upon himself to redefine treason as meaning criticism of him and his administration. And so when they mass arrested, they, when they suspended habeas corpus and mass arrested thousands of northern state citizens for speaking up against him and his administration and his war, that's the reason they used. They said this is treason, but they had unilaterally and unconstitutionally and illegally redefined treason to mean criticism of me. And, uh, and, and that's, that, yeah, that's where this comes from, criticism of the government. But that's not the definition of treason that's in the Constitution. All right. Well, actually, you handled that much faster than I thought. So in that case, I'm going to throw <laughs> one more question at you, which is this. For some reason, with topics other than the war, any, any topic in American history, any topic in the news right now, well, Trump throws this a little bit out of kilter, which is the the uh, the idea that generally people can see nuance. Now, with Trump, they can't. So let's just say up till the year 2016, people could see nuance. So if you were to say this is a great struggle between good and evil, describing whatever, uh, a, a lot of the sophisticated people would just mock you, you know, because they know that there's it's you know. So if you were to say the Cold War was a struggle between good and evil, oh, all the sophisticated people would just roll their eyes at you. But for some reason. You get to the the Civil War, and yeah, yeah, it's just uh, angels and devils and and so on. So I think we've thrown a little cold water on that. But what I want to do is just as we close, just talk about some of the more mundane reasons that somebody might have supported Lincoln. I mean, we know that yeah, there's opposition to slavery in the North, but in terms of the intensity of it, the Liberty Party would get maybe at most two percent of the vote. So it wasn't like it was the uppermost thing on people's minds. If you asked them, you pinned them down, they'd say, yeah, it's not that great a system. Yeah, we're, we're not in favor of it. But that's certainly not what's driving an industrialist to support Lincoln. It's, it's, he's just driven by, if he were that driven by an opposition to slavery, he wouldn't have been satisfied with the Republican platform at all. 
So what were some of the more mundane concerns that might have made somebody support a politician like Lincoln? Well, Lincoln got the nomination because of his record as a lifelong or career-long protectionist. And he, he raised tariffs 10 times during his administration. The, the average tariff rate went from 15% to over to around 50% or, or more and stayed there for 60 years. And that, that's one reason. So the northern manufacturers were for him. And uh, also, uh, he, he, he and the Republican Party uh, opposed the extension of slavery into the territories, but they defended Southern slavery in their platform, and Lincoln did in his first inaugural. But the reason they gave was they wanted to keep the territories, Lincoln said, for free white labor. So he was arguing to protect the uh, free white labor from competition from both free blacks and slaves. And so that was uh, totally an economic thing. And also there was a three-fifths clause of the Constitution. Uh, if slaves did go into the uh, territories, they were afraid that it might have increased the uh, number of members of Congress in the Democrat Party. And they were very open about that. They said, well, that'll, that'll impede our ability to enact our economic agenda of protectionist tariffs uh, on national bank and corporate welfare for the railroad corporations. And so, you know, Lincoln was an old railroad corporation lawyer. He represented all the big railroad companies, including the Illinois Central in the Midwest. And that's how he got elected. He traveled around on a, a private rail car with an entourage of uh, Illinois Central executives and wore expensive suits. He lived in the biggest house in Springfield, Illinois, on a street that today is called Old Aristocracy Row. That's who he was. He was not the old poverty-stricken rail splitter that you read about in elementary school. And those are some of the reasons, uh, uh, you know, people voted, voted for Lincoln. Uh, and he was also a, a pork barrel politician, of course. You know, he, he got the ball rolling, and uh, I call him the founding father of crony capitalism, and that uh, the Pacific Railway Bill that got the ball rolling for massive subsidies to corporations, which had been debated for many years and had had no success until Lincoln came along. Well, the book is The Problem with Lincoln by our guest Tom DiLorenzo. I'm linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 1688. This book is a 10 megaton bomb. <laughs> I mean, in, in what it does to the elites of the U.S. and the standard view of American history and all that, it very much needs to be done, particularly because of the absolutely, indisputably evil purposes to which the, the Lincoln myth has been applied. It's very, very important to, because right now we have a lot of iconoclasm going on, but it's completely the wrong kind of iconoclasm. You want to be an iconoclast, you read The Problem with Lincoln by Tom DiLorenzo. Tom, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Tom. Have a great day. All right, folks, before we let you go, a heartwarming little item to tell you about. One of my listeners has just written a book for a younger audience called Hugo the Sock Bandit, Hugo the Sock Bandit is not political in any way. It's just an adventure in the vein of classic Roald Dahl for kids or the kid inside. With the world gone mad, everyone could use a break. And so the idea is that in this book, you're going to escape into the world of Hugo Martin, a eight-year-old boy who discovers that socks are actually alive. Hugo the Sock Bandit is an imaginative adventure story for the whole family. Get away from the real world and discover the hidden world of socks and finally find out why socks always come out of the dryer in odd numbers. So check out HugoTheSockBandit.com. You'll find links to buy the book in both print and ebook edition, as well as merchandise, shirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, links to social media, all that stuff. HugoTheSockBandit.com. You will enjoy very much. The Woods Girls give it their 100% uh, endorsement. So go uh, check that out over at HugoTheSockBandit.com. And again, if you would like to get publicity for the website you're thinking of creating, make sure you get your hosting through me, and then you get publicity and some other great bonuses that will give you a big, big leg up. So get all the information about that over at TomWoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow, Scott Horton returns to the show. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.